Heritage is the Peabody Award-winning series of conversations with men and women who have made significant contributions to our times. It is produced for the National Educational Television and Radio Center. Our distinguished guest is Mortimer J. Adler, author, philosopher, and co-editor with Robert M. Hutchins of the Encyclopedia Britannica's Great Books of the Western World. He is currently director of the Institute for Philosophical Research. The future of philosophy is the subject of this fourth and final program with Mr. Adler. The interviewers are Thomas S. Hall, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, Washington University, St. Louis, and the Reverend Walter J. Ong, S.J., Professor of English at St. Louis University. Well, may I first make one emendation on your last statement? I think that we live in a society which emphasizes science more and more and cultivates or esteems philosophy less and less. I don't think I would quite say that liberal education should make everybody a philosopher, though I do think it should equip everybody to think about the common perennial problems of mankind, most of which are philosophical problems. And that leads me to the, to, to the point you want me to discuss. Science, science as compared with philosophy, consists of, 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 of quite a large variety of methods of inquiry for solving questions about the phenomenal world, the world of phenomena. Uh, philosophy, I think, goes much deeper than that. It asks questions about the ultimate nature of reality, the causes and the underlying principles of things. And particularly, it is concerned with the basic questions of right and wrong, good and bad, which constitute, in a variety of ways, the problems of ethics and politics and even economics. Now, you ask me what science can do and what philosophy can do. Let me t tell you what I learned as a teacher. Many years I taught philosophy in college, and after the beginning of any course, some very bright student would come and say, Professor, all of this is very interesting, very interesting, but what use is it? And as a young teacher, I would sort of hem and haw about that, and I gradually learned to say, no use at all in your meaning of the word use. Because I, I began to learn that what most contemporary students mean by use is the kind of use that science has, a technological use, the application of knowledge for the control of nature and the production of things, an artistic use, a use in, in, in the manufacture or making of things. Now, then I would say, but there's another kind of use that knowledge can have. Knowledge can direct you to the ends you should seek. It can give you some sense of judgment about the order of means and the order of goods in the pursuit of those ends. So I would say that the utility of philosophy is very, in some sense, a higher utility than the utility of science. Science gives us control over the means. Philosophy gives us direction to the ends and some measure or judgment of the worth of the means to use. Let me, let me illustrate this. Science gives us the power to, to kill and cure, but doesn't tell us whether we should kill or cure. Science gives us the power to create, to, 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 to uh, uh, handle atomic energy, but it doesn't tell us how to use it. I mean, the moralist, the statesman, the political philosopher must be called in or must be at least required to think about the use to which these powerful instruments should be put. It seems to me that in every case, the serious problem is the philosophical problem, the easier problem, the scientific one. You know the expression armchair thinker? And it's usually a, a term of derogation. Yeah. And, and scientists use it because they are not armchair thinkers. No self-respecting scientist would think he could solve any problems sitting in an armchair. I noticed up. that all our chairs here are armchair. Are. <laughs> well, we, we are all philosophers, so we are all armchair thinkers. Because what I want to say is that a mathematician is an armchair thinker. Any, any mathematician faced with his problems can solve them even without pencil and paper. But the most he needs in the way of apparatus is something to scribble on. It's a problem entirely of analysis and of thought. He doesn't have to increase his experience or get new data by experimentation or research. Now, philosophy, like mathematics, though it differs in other respects, is armchair thinking. The only experience the philosopher needs is the common experience of mankind, the experience you and I have by keeping our eyes open while we're awake, our ears and eyes open. For example, the question, let me give you one concrete example of this. If you see a leaf fall, or a stone fall, uh, as they do in nature, 
you can ask the philosophical question that Aristotle asks about motion, namely, what is it? What is the nature of any local motion? How do you define a local motion? What are the indispensable conditions of something's moving from place to place? But Galileo can't answer, Galileo being a scientist, can't answer his kind of question by looking at a stone fall. His question is not, what is the nature of motion? But what is the velocity of a freely falling body? What, what is its acceleration? How does it change its speed of velocity from moment to moment or place to place? To answer that kind of question, he has to invent an inclined plane, use a water clock, make measurements, apply mathematics to the measurements. Without, without research, without investigation, without data that no common experience provides, he on, can't advance science. On the other hand, doesn't it seem that at least in some cases, a, s a philosophy will grow out of data which are other than those which man has by common experience. I can give you an example of Please. what I mean. Uh, since the discovery of evolution, it would seem that certain philosophical questions have come into existence which did not exist before. Uh, a Christian, for instance, would say, well, uh, we know that God created the universe, but until evolution was discovered, we didn't know that when God created material things, they evolved. Now, this would seem to be something relevant to the uh, nature of material well, things. I think I would admit, Father Ang, that the philosopher does have certain problems in commenting on the results or discoveries of science in relation to common experience. I mean, there are two things here. There is common experience and, uh, and scientific knowledge, which is part of our common heritage. The philosopher does have to, he yes. sometimes have to criticize I mean, uh, the, the, the conclusion that scientists draw when they draw philosophical conclusions from scientific evidence. At the edges of science, scientists and philosophers, Einstein and Bohr, for example, argue about the, the operation of the law of contradiction in subatomic physics, you see. They are ceasing to, because they, they can't solve that problem, they can't solve by experimentation or research. On the edges of science, philosophical questions begin to appear where philosophers and scientists become mixed in conversation. I, I think you're right about that. That's but true. the philosopher, or the scientist proceeding philosophically never proceeds by experiment or research, but only by thought. Yes. Uh, I think my sense of its importance is as follows. Uh, I would say that if you looked at the, the, the cultural history of the West, you will see that the, in the ancient world, philosophy was the dominant component of the, the civilization. Uh, and philosophy contained religion and science inchoately in itself. I mean, below itself, it had the law of the, the, uh, Aristotle, for example, dealt with religious questions and science, but in, in virtue of being a philosopher. In the Middle Ages, the dominant science was theology. And theology, though it gradually got separated from philosophy, uh, subordinated it, properly subordinated it, and philosophy then, in, still inchoately, uh, included science. The thing that's happened in the modern world, the most extraordinary thing that's happened, and really is, I think it's an advance over these earlier, is we now, I think, are in a position to distinguish the questions which science can answer, the questions which belong to philosophy to answer, and the questions which belong to religion to answer. I would say that the, the three great speculative questions that, that Kant mentions, the question about the existence of God, the immortality of the soul, and the freedom of the will, are, are among the most important speculative questions the mind can answer in the practical order, the question about human happiness, about the virtues, about moral duty and obligation are among the most important, or the, the just that rejects the questions that science cannot answer is closing its mind to the most important concerns of any human being. This is a hard question, Dean Hall. Could I um, take two steps to answer instead of one? I would say you have two things on the side of science that uh, are admirable and that um, make philosophy look weak or sick by comparison. One, you do make steady progress. The last 300 years is a history of magnificent progress. Yeah, okay. Long periods of time, it is an, an amazing advancement of knowledge, isn't it? Secondly, don't you have a sense that in any field of scientific research, you can expect agreement at the edge of, uh, of work among the competent? I mean, pretty, pretty well. Pretty well. Uh, and uh, you look at philosophers, and you, you seem to see no progress. And as the saying goes, philosophers always disagree. There's no agreement. Now, let me answer both those points. And then uh, I think if one expects a philosophy, the same kind of progress that you have in science, then you, then you are misjudging philosophy. Or if you look for the same kind of agreement 
in philosophies and science, again, you're applying. Uh, the, and I think what's happened, by the way, is that people, uh, the low evaluation of the philosophy is, comes from applying to philosophy the standards that have arisen in judging science, scientific success or scientific advancement. I think, for example, that there is as much agreement in philosophy as there is in science only in the following way. Agreement in science occurs among contemporaries. Scientists of the last 10 years will disagree with scientists of 100 years ago, and they will disagree with their forebears. In philosophy, agreement is not contemporary agreement among the, the advanced, most competent men in the field, but it's agreement across the ages. Aquinas with Aristotle, Maritain with Aquinas, for example, Dewey with Locke, Locke with, see? The, the, the agreement is not an agreement among contemporaries. There's a disagreement, and there's a great deal of agreement in the long tradition of philosophy. If this is true in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, I would think that the way which you have to look at progress in philosophy is somewhat as follows. That in the course of the centuries, new theories, new ideas, new analyses, new insights are developed. The, prolifer the prol proliferation of, of hypotheses, if you will, or of philosophical explanations and theories. Now, some way in that broadening scope of philosophical analysis, more and more truth is being added along with more and more error. That is, you proliferate errors, and the problem is to, to which we haven't begun to do yet, is to sift the truth from the error. I would like to say here that I think the failure of philosophy to make progress in the last 2,500 years is the most serious charge against it. And I think there's a way of making progress in the future that hasn't been put, brought to bear yet on the there is something like experimentation, and the point is that philosophy hasn't begun to use this technique yet. You know, uh, science goes back to the Greeks, but the Greeks were not they were empirical without being experimental. There was me medieval science that was only slightly experimental. And the great progress in science was when the experimental method became the center of the scientific enterprise. And that's happened in the last 300 years. Now, I say that as experimental research is to mere empirical exploration. So philosophical debate is to mere discussion. And now by debate, I mean the, the highest, most rational use of the mind in which men of opposed opinions, really differing on, on an issue, genuinely disagreeing with, with, the, with all the agreements and understanding that, is required, that are required for gender disagreement, meet one another. Or if there are several positions, the several meet each other. And argue rationally, coherently, dispassionately, meeting argument with argument so that you have the fullest exploration of the difference of opinion. This actually, you know, we talk about the great philosophical debate or philosophical controversy, and the work that the Institute of Philosophical Research in San Francisco has done in the last years, eight years on freedom, I think when the two volumes, particularly the second volume that's now in the process of being published, come out, is irrefutable evidence that there has been almost no controversy at all about freedom. You know, been act by, by controversy, I mean real joining of issues as opposed to apparent disagreements. And where there are re is real joining of issue, genuine debate of the issue, almost none. Do you know the phrase therapeutic positivism? Don't know it. <laughs> well, uh, I, I am, uh, let me first say what the positivists are, answer your question, and say where I agree with them and where I disagree. The positivists, are a group of contemporary thinkers, most of them, who I think, miscalling themselves philosophers, uh, who, following Hume, maintain that scientific method or mathematical analysis are the only ways of answering questions with objective validity. And if a question is not answerable in this way, it is not a genuine question, not a, an answerable or significant question. They say nonsense to it, or not uh, insignificant. Now, here I think they're wrong. Uh, and I disagree with them uh, in dismissing the whole range of traditional philosophical questions. This is their negativism. Now, I agree with them, however, in thinking that the, the great history of Western philosophy is, is, re, re, is open to criticism, that in fact, the issues have not been sharply put, that the philosophers have not engaged one another in a real joining of minds to debate the issues. Now, they don't, they, they don't make that criticism. They simply think that the, that the history of Western thought so far has been imprecise, vague, poetic. And I think it has been poetic. I think the, I think the philosophical enterprise carried on by the individual philosopher as a work of individual genius 
makes it more like a work of art or poetry than a work of science, you see. I think the philosophical enterprise is as much collaborative, cooperative, teamwork kind of thing as science is. The outstanding philosophers of the West, and I could name all, have not addressed themselves to one another. I mean, they, their criticisms of their predecessors is really glancing rather than direct. Each one lives in his self-encased world, his own system of ideas, and is satisfied to present his own as eloquently and forcefully as possible, and often fails to recognize the arguments of his opponents or the points at which he's is at issue with them. In other words, difficult, painstaking, long drawn out process of intellectual confrontation and debate, which is the philosophical job, has not been done. A culture is uh, a poor culture that doesn't place a high value on the philosophical pursuit, the examination of the most fundamental ideas and problems. I see, think, secondly, that that pursuit must be carried on in a better way than it has been in the past. Both those things are consistent. Well, it, it, it need not be a confrontation uh, in a personal address. It could be in writing. I mean, yes. By the way, there have been a few extraordinary interchanges in the history of philosophy uh, in the field of the great question of free will. Hobbes and Bishop Bramhall argued back and forth, Priestley and Price. And in our own day, we see a little bit of that debate between uh, the Scotch philosopher C.A. Campbell and the English positivist or analyst Noel Smith. And even this little bit, which isn't very good, by the way, is, is very enlightening as to what could be done if, if philosophers are willing patiently to address themselves to a common question and, and answer one another's arguments. This is seldom done. Uh, now, may I add one more thing? The kind of work that we are doing at the Institute is, I think, a, a, a propodotic to this. I mean, it's, it's a, an introduction to what we've done in the field of freedom is to say, can we take stock of what has been thought about freedom See if we can find out where there are agreements, where there are disagreements, state the disagreements, as, the real disagreements, as opposed to the apparent ones, as carefully and precisely as possible. Find out if there are any arguments, state them, and say, here it is. This is as much that's been done, the rest of it, much repetition, much waste, much missing of the point, much passing of ships in the night, you see. They, uh, they are continually eliminating problems that I think cannot be eliminated, and they do it, of course, by this resort to an analysis of common speech. I mean, every, everything can be solved by finding what people mean in common speech, which I think is a, a minor instrument of, of clarification. I, I, I'm really saying that if they paid attention, with, even with, with their semantic and linguistic techniques, to the great discourses of philosophers that have something to clarify, but they, they, they actually, for the most part, I, I must charge them with a vast ignorance. Most of them are not read, well read. Most of them are simply ignorant of the, the great works in the philosophical tradition. Yet they dismissed them with a wave of their hand. Uh, Mr. Adler, would you want to say something um, about the, what you consider the particular value of philosophy in a technological civilization? It is of greater value in a technological uh, civilization than in any other. I agree. And the simple, simple reason is, uh, I may be using a uh, too simple a point here, a technological civilization is one in which men have more and more and more power at their disposal. Well, the more power, if you have a more powerful car, it is more important that you know the direction and the control of it, correct? I mean, if you have a, a horse and buggy could be driven more safely than a, uh, a very powerful automobile. Now, we have tremendous power at our disposal, and the absence of philosophy from our lives and our society means we have the power without a sense of direction, without a sense of control, without a sense of the values, which administer that power. So I think that philosophical wisdom, if it's procurable in any degree, is more and more necessary in a highly technological society which puts so much power in the hands of men. Wouldn't you think that's so, do you know? Surely, yes. During the Middle Ages, as you know, there were some, some remarkable disputes. It took place at the University of Paris, the University of Oxford, which maybe 1,000 or 2,000 students heard. Now, suppose we could create, see, I think that the, the television is seldom used for debate. It hasn't been used for real debate even in this last political campaign. I mean, that's not debate in any real sense of the term. Suppose educational television or television were used to present to all the thinking people of this land, and there are a large number of them, the really fine debates of basic questions where the best minds we could summon from all over the world faced one another and over a sustained period of time, maybe not in one hour, but in several hours or 10 hours, carried on the most careful argument back and forth. I, I cannot think of, there is nothing I would rather hear than a, a long, 
carefully planned, beautifully executed debate of this question by an atheist on the one hand and a theist on the other, and a pantheist on the third side. Nothing would seem to be, would illuminate my mind more. On the other hand, don't we have to face the question that to clarify a philosophical issue is a much more difficult problem than clarifying a scientific uh, issue? I've often felt that science is child's play compared to philosophy, if you permit me to say this, sir. Uh, and the reason why science has advanced so much further than philosophy is that philosophy is so much more difficult than science, much more difficult. It requires, I think, a much uh, more disciplined use of the human mind. And by, another reason for it, that the philosophical questions are more closely connected with our passions. Mm -hmm. Our passions and our inclinations, and the, I'm greatly impressed by Father Taya Dajardin's picture of man's progress in the last 80,000 years on Earth. From primeval slime, he's come to the point where, where we can carry on some kind of conversation. It took 80,000 years. I think the level of human conversation, debate, is still very low and very poor. Are you hopeful? I think perhaps in another 10 or 15,000 years, man will begin to achieve some of the promise of his rationality, and that 25,000 years from now, philosophy will be where it is not yet.